We are here with Mike Monatos, president of Monatos and Monatos, um, public affairs firm in Washington, D.C., who many of uh, you in our community know and have met in our various events and have certainly seen him as he attends our gala every year and is a very integral part of the Greek American and Cypriot American community in advocating for our issues in Congress. Welcome, Mike. Thank you, Christiana. Thank you for having me. Good to see you. Um, and uh, this is a great opportunity. You'll have to excuse my, my COVID beard I have here. There's certain <laughs> elements and maybe even my COVID hair, but uh, it's great to be with you. It's great. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, you know, this whole experience, notwithstanding of the pandemic, there's a lot that one could discuss, uh, both about Greece and Cyprus and how well they've been doing. But I kind of wanted to delve more specifically into the evolution of Hellenic advocacy. Uh, starting with, your firm has been present in Washington, D.C. for decades now. And I'd love for our community to know a little bit more about all that you've done. I know this is three generations back, if I'm not mistaken. So why don't That's you right. give us a, a quick introduction? Well, thank you for the opportunity. So uh, for over eight years now, Manitas has been working in or with the federal government. And 1936, uh, my namesake, my papu, Mike Manitas, came to Washington, D.C. to work in the United States Senate. After uh, 12, over 20 years there, he was asked by uh, then President Kennedy to join him in the White House and serve as the president's Senate liaison, the, the representative of the White House in the United States Senate. And after uh, the assassination, did stayed on with uh, President Johnson. Uh, my father, the, the second generation, uh, worked on Capitol Hill for a number of years and then was um, brought on to the Carter administration, the administration of President Jimmy Carter. He was actually, of all the assistant secretaries of all the agencies, he was the youngest assistant secretary. And he was over in the Commerce Department and handled congressional affairs. So when my dad came out of the Carter administration, he and my papu started Manitas of Manitas. And they, 1983, and I've been there since 1990, so over 30 years now, working with my father. Um, it's been a, a real privilege, but just so that's that's the, the timeline, and, and the way we got involved in advocating for Greece and Cyprus was really uh, because of my family working uh, with U.S. policymakers for so long. We developed uh, trusted long-time relationships uh, in both parties um, in Washington, and so when crises started to happen for Greece and Cyprus, uh, the Manitas family was the one that uh, a lot of these um, leaders in Greece and Cyprus came to. So for example, in 1964, everyone's familiar with the 1974 Turkish invasion of Cyprus, but not as many are familiar with the 1964 attempt when Turkey sent its warships towards Cyprus. And there's the famous Johnson letter in the middle of the night that President Johnson sent to Turkey telling them to turn their ships around and they would have a problem with the United States if they invaded Cyprus. Well, my papu was one of those who was woken up in the middle of the night to help write the Johnson letter. Fast wow. forward to 1974, um, after the uh, Turkish invasion of Cyprus, um, there was legislation in the United States Congress to uh, put a arms embargo on Turkey. Um, even though the Nixon administration at the time didn't feel uh, it was the case, law clearly stated that if American weapons were used aggressively against an ally, um, aid to that country would be halted. And so there was a, a major effort in the Congress in the House of Representatives, then Congressman uh, Paul Sarbanes and Congressman John Bradamus, who led the legislation to cut off arms to Turkey in the Senate. It was led by Senator Thomas Eagleton of Missouri. And a lot of people say, well, why Thomas Eagleton of Missouri? because his legislative director was Andy Manitas. And so my father got his senator to lead the charge in the Senate and ended up um, blocking aid to Turkey because of the invasion of Cyprus. So it was really out of that, that and, and other such occurrences that the Manitas family got involved. And so when we started the firm, we started to do more work um, for Greece and Cyprus and Washington, but primarily for the, the national Greek American community. Um, we also, um, in our, our, our private lives, serve my father and I serve on the board of the top national Greek American organizations uh, from Leadership 100 
to the archons of the ecumenical patriarchate, the archdiocese and council, to the National Hellenic Society, and have done so for decades. And so in that capacity, I have uh, developed, again, long-term trusted relationships with some of the most influential uh, Greek Americans across the country who are active in advocating for issues. And as well, I've worked with many or uh, most of the 500 Greek Orthodox churches across the country as well in those capacities. So when we uh, do things in Washington with policymakers for the national Greek American community and for Greece and Cyprus, it's utilizing all these relationships that we've built over 80 plus years now. And there's one distinction I want to make there because I think the American Hellenic Council, and I should have really started uh, by saying this, um, you know, I've, we've had the honor of working with the American Hellenic Council over decades. And as you mentioned, I've been to the annual gala every year for the last 10 years and doing what we can to support the American Hellenic Council. But we work with, in addition to these prominent Greek American leaders, we work with the top Greek American organizations. And as I've said at the gala every year, when I speak that there are few, if any, organizations that get it like the American Hellenic Council does. Um, you all are not only have found a way to have a successful event for so over 40 years now, right? Your annual gala. Yes. And still sell out the room and have interesting honorees. Um, so the passion is still there, but you also understand how uh, Washington works and will develop relationships with your policymakers and advocate for Greece and Cyprus and, and Hellenism and Orthodoxy with those policymakers. Um, and so uh, we've had the privilege of working with the American Hellenic Council. Uh, for all those years, but with also other organizations um, that do similar types of things from um, the American Hellenic Institute in Washington or HEPA in, headquartered in Washington or the Hellenic American Leadership Council, a newer organization, very effective with uh, the next generation of Greek Americans uh, online, getting them engaged online. Um, and in numerous other organizations um, all around the country. But um, that's another part of what we do. But to, to distinguish ourselves from the other ones is we are professional lobbyists. And as I've laid out, have had decades upon decades of dealing with US policymakers, and that's our specialty. These other organizations have their specialties and they do them very well. And I think uh, one of the secrets of success of the Greek American lobby, even though the a line everybody likes to use is, gosh, if we were more united, we could do so much more. But the fact of the matter is we're united in cause, but each of us has our own specialty. And each of those organizations, if they focus on that and stick to that and we support each other in doing those things that we're best at, that's where we can be most powerful and effective. Um, so given all your history, your family history, your firm history, your personal history with uh, working for advocating for Hellenism, what would you say, how would you say rather, the perception of Greece and Cyprus has changed over the year, over the years, the political perception uh, right. in the US, like in Congress, what you see in DC? Well, what, what I see now is um, the relationships be, between the United States and Greece, the United States and Cyprus are really the, the best they've ever been. And there are a number of factors for that. Um, but uh, it, it has evolved over the years, as you mentioned, and a lot of it is driven by um, what Turkey is doing in the region. Um, there's no better advocate for strong U.S., Greece, and U.S. Cyprus relations than Erdogan himself. The way he's conducting himself is making very clear which, what Greece and Cyprus and the Greek American community has known all along, uh, that he is truly a tyrant and not to be a trusted ally, of, an ally at all. Um, and so the more he behaves in these ways, the, the, the more it makes sense for the United States to even grow closer to Greece and Cyprus. I know they like to say that these are two separate issues, but um, what's held relationships back over the years has been the hesitance of the United States to do certain things that help Greece and Cyprus because it would upset Turkey. Or flip that on, on around in that when Turkey was doing things you know, against human rights, against the rule of law, against Greece and Cyprus, the United States was hesitant to tell Turkey to, to cut it out, to, to do the right thing because of the, the so-called importance of Turkey in the region. Uh, so that's one factor, but truly the leadership in those countries uh, is another major factor in why relationships are the best they've ever been. Uh, with the Mitsotakis government, you've seen the short period of time they've been in office, 
uh, there'd be an even greater strides in closening of relationships between the two countries. And in Cyprus, um, with this administration, um, the president, the foreign minister, uh, on throughout the different agencies, the, the energy minister have gone a long way to really uh, put meat on the bones of the relationship between the U.S. and Cyprus. Um, a lot of it has to do, I think, with uh, the representatives in the United States, the face of our community. Um, the new archbishop that we have, Elpida Foros, as much as Archbishop Demetrius was a very well-respected, um, very um, pious man, um, this new archbishop has brought some fresh new energy um, to the community, I think, in many ways, and um, a fresh new face of the community with a lot of U.S. policymakers. Uh, the ambassadors in both countries, the U.S. ambassadors in Greece and Cyprus, Ambassador Pyatt, I think uh, just about everyone would agree, is one of the best we've ever had. And we've had some very good ambassadors over there over the years. Um, the new ambassador of Cyprus is doing an excellent job. The ambassadors of Greece and Cyprus to the United States uh, are also doing an excellent job, and especially you had as one of your recent guests, Ambassador Papadopoulou, who's truly remarkable um, and not only a very effective, a talented diplomat, but um, is the is the right hand of the prime minister, which is very important with any country when their representative in Washington has that kind of a close personal relationship with the person who's running the country. It's, it means a lot, and so it's great that the prime minister had sent her. So as you can see, there's a lot of factors that play into the very strong relationship that is going on now, but we can talk a little bit later in the discussion about the um, new prism through which the United States is seeing Greece and Cyprus, the Eastern mm -hmm. Mediterranean Partnership, because that's another important factor. Yes, uh, it seems that there have been pivotal moments uh, leading up to the changes that have occurred uh, in U.S.-Greece relations, U.S.-Cyprus relations, and certainly that led up to the signing of the Eastern Mediterranean Partnership Act. I know that uh, speaking with Ambassador Papadopoulou, as you mentioned, she referenced uh, the importance of, of Greece's, uh, or rather of the U.S. support of Greece during our economic crisis, which changed public perception in Greece of the United States and certainly facilitated uh, the public discourse being open to these relationships, uh, to strengthening our, our community bonds. Uh, what other pivotal moments would you say have occurred in the past four decades that have led us to where we are today in Greece-US relations and Cyprus-US relations? So yeah, there, there have been uh, certain moments in time where the United States has really stepped forward and done the right thing. You know, As I said before, I think, when, when, if you look at when relationships were um, not the best or even say the worst they've been, it's been at times again when Turkey was beating up on Greece and Cyprus and violating human rights and the rule of law, and the United States was just silent or had a very a tempered reaction. Um, and rightly so, Greece and Cyprus had every reason to be upset. And frankly, as Americans, we had every reason to be upset because that's not in the best interest of our country to be conducting itself that way with, with allies, Greece and Cyprus, or even frankly with allies like Turkey who behave in those kinds of ways. Um, so, you know, it's, uh, so the times where like during the Clinton administration, what comes to mind is uh, with Richard Holbrook, who's a very talented um, uh, diplomat, uh, everything from the EMEA crisis, diffusing that to um, the uh, Macedonian issue um, while it was still in the early stages, getting Macedonia, so-called Macedonia, to remove certain threats against Greece in its constitution and change its currency. Um, the Ammonia Five that were, uh, you know, uh, facing death in, mm -hmm. in, in Albania. Um, the, the Clinton administration came through well. The Ecumenical Patriarchate. Um, Hillary Clinton, then First Lady, visited the Ecumenical Patriarchy. And as you can imagine, that sends a, a great signal to Turkey. Turkey wants to see uh, the Ecumenical Patriarch as a leader of the less than 2,000 Greek Orthodox Christians in Turkey, when he is, in fact, the world leader of over 300 million Orthodox Christians around the world. So if the world's um, greatest country's first lady visits, that sends a signal. And then she brought back with her, to her credit, uh, president Clinton, who was the first sitting president in the United States to visit the ecumenical patriarchy. So the, those were kinds of things, those are mm -hmm. times when relationships were, were particularly good. 
or there were peak moments in those relationships. Um, you know, I think that the Macedonian issue challenged everyone. I think a lot of Greek Americans, a lot of people in Greece, and a lot of people in the United States were frustrated by how that developed, especially how long it, it, it evolved. Um, you know, the Cyprus issue uh, there, it's wonderful to see in recent years, the United States seeing Cyprus uh, from a bilateral perspective and not defining Cyprus by the Cyprus problem. Um, I love your glass, by the way. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, um, you know, that, that, those are those are some some thoughts. Um, but you know, over the 40, 50 years we've been doing this, um, there have been a lot of ups and downs. But we're all enjoying a very, very positive times. But let me let me then now transition to the Eastern Mediterranean uh, partnership agreement that you mentioned, because that is something we've been working on for many years. As, as others in our community have. Decades ago, it was Andy Athens and, and Maynard Wishner, the American Jewish Committee, who started to find ways to strengthen the relationship between the Jewish community in the United States and the Greek American community. And they had delegations that went to Greece and to Cyprus together. And that really built. Um, when David Harris came in as head of the AJC, it was taken to a whole new level. Um, and you saw relationships between the countries of Greece, Cyprus, and Israel start to evolve as well. And um, what we've been pushing for in the United States for many years, and what is now crystallized into this legislation that was passed, is when the United States looks to Greece and Cyprus, they're important countries, but you know, Cyprus is a population of under one, pretty much the size of a congressional district, and <laughs> Greece is about 11 million people. So in the scheme of things, while those countries are important to us, they're an important region, they're, they're very small countries. However, if the United States starts to more accurately look at the value of Greece and Cyprus in the prism of Greece, Cyprus, and Israel, and the only trusted democracies in that region in a very dangerous part of the world, uh, it, it raises the value of Greece and Cyprus to the United States to the level which we as Greek Americans see it. And so we've been working very hard on that, uh, so getting the United States to do more to support those evolving relationships and involving itself into that relationship. I think it was uh, the first time uh, last year that the United States went to this annual meeting of Greece, Cyprus, and Israel. And, and so then from that came this legislation uh, that was introduced in 2019, Senator Menendez and Senator Rubio in the Senate and the House by the chair of the Middle East Subcommittee, Ted Deutsch of Florida, along with Gus Arrakis and David Cicilline. And we were um, working behind the scenes as were some others in the community to try to get not only co-sponsorship and support for that legislation, but try to get it actually adopted. But our, our secret weapon truly is Senator Bob Menendez. Um, there has been truly in, in, in our decades of work, I can't imagine anybody who has been more effective, more productive than Senator Menendez. We've had some great ones over the years, Senator Paul Sarb, and son John Sarbanes now and Gus Arrakis and the Greek American, they've fought very hard for issues. But uh, the way Bob Menendez has, particularly as chairman and now as ranking member of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, made Cyprus and Greece a priority in very substantive ways is truly remarkable. And it's one thing to introduce legislation and get co sponsors, but another thing to find a way to get it adopted in legislation that's moving through the Senate, as he did in this end of the year legislation uh, to determine the the funding for the country, he was able to get this legislation in there and the wording in there and therefore adopted and signed into law. Um, without Bob, I don't know where we'd be. So he's a, a true gift to our community. But it's it's now, as, as you probably saw, that legislation, just for those that are unfamiliar with it, the key elements of that, well, first of all, Menendez said when it was passed that, and I think this is a good summary, that this legislation marks the dawn of a new day for the United States engagement in the Eastern Mediterranean bolstered by strong and expanding relationships with Greece, Israel, and Cyprus. This legislation will significantly strengthen our joint efforts to promote peace, prosperity, and security. Um, what the legislation does, the, the top four or five things, is it lifts the prohibition on the arms sales of the Republic of Cyprus. It authorizes the establishment of the United States Eastern Mediterranean Energy Center to facilitate energy cooperation between the US, Israel, Greece, and Cyprus. It authorizes foreign military financing for Greece. It authorizes international military education and training or IMET assistance for Greece and for Cyprus. And it requires, and this is important, requires the administration to submit to Congress a strategy 
on enhanced security and energy cooperation with the countries in the Eastern Mediterranean, as well as reports on malign activities by Russia and other countries in the region. So this forces the administration to think through more carefully ways the United States can be helpful in fostering that uh, relationship between the three slash four countries. Another thing we've been working on that hasn't gotten that kind of attention is trying to, through the appropriations process, develop a, a strengthening or a, um, a, a, a way to, a, 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 let, me, let me back up a little bit, and that's why I'm starting to, to hesitate here. While things are really bad with Turkey right now, as time has shown, things will get better, whether there's a new leader in Turkey or whether Erdogan finds a way to control himself a little more, things between the United States and Turkey will get better. When they do, we can't have this current intense focus on US, Greece and US Cyprus relations die down as a result. So we're trying to find ways to formalize this relationship with the Eastern Mediterranean partnership. So we're trying to create funding to allow for as we were able to get in the appropriations legislation last year through Congresswoman Nita Lowy, the chairman of the Appropriations Committee, uh, an annual summit uh, between Greece, that would bring over the United States, the ministers uh, of, of defense, foreign affairs, and energy from Greece, Cyprus, and Israel to further explore strengthening the relationship between these four countries and those areas. So there's a lot going on in the Congress to try to, again, formalize and strengthen uh, these relationships because in the end, um, we need this kind of foundation for, again, when things get better with Turkey, um, we need reminders of the United States and why Greece and Cyprus matter to the United States. Mm -hmm. um, I know you have a close relationship with Senator Menendez. What would you say motivates his, this Phil Hellenism he, he seems to have and his commitment to, to Hellenism? Well, I'd love to tell the story about how it started because it shows that one person can make a difference, um, whether in our issues or in government in general. And there was a member of Congress, Bob Menendez in New Jersey, and one of his constituents is a Cypriot American, Ta uh, Tasso Zambas. And Tasso, as anybody who knows Tasso, is a very spirited, passionate person, particularly about the Cyprus issue. And Tasso Zambas, as the story goes, went up to Bob Menendez's house and knocked on his door and said, my name is Tasso Zambas, I'm a neighbor, I'm a constituent, and I want to talk to you about the Cyprus issue. Well, Tasso is also a, um, one of the nicest people I ever meet and hit it off with Bob. They became close personal friends and he's kept the senator educated, engaged. The senator also is uh, of Cuban background and there are a lot of similarities between the Cuban American community's experience and the Cyprus American community's experience. And so um, it is... Uh, that kind of thing that started it, but Bob Menendez is this lethal combination of intelligence and, and, and passion for the issues he, he works on and believes in. And um, he is a tough son of a gun. It's great to have him <laughs> on your team. I wouldn't want to be on the other side, uh, but he's uh, very well respected on both sides of the aisle. Um, mm -hmm. And we couldn't have a better advocate. So it, I think all those factors combined. And then, you know, the national community has really been there for him. He's had some uh, some tough re-elections, particularly the most recent one, and the community really jumped in and did all they could to try to help work towards his re-election. So mm -hmm. I think he appreciates that as well. And um, God, I, I hope he doesn't go anywhere anytime soon. I think it's important to for all of us to recognize the the importance of engaging with our members of Congress, engaging with our representatives. I think it has become increasingly um, we, we have become increasingly pessimistic or cynical about our ability to affect change. And it's important to remember that our representatives are literally our representatives. And if we don't reach out to them, they will only respond to those who do reach out to them. And it's oftentimes interests that reach out to him instead of individuals. So it is incumbent on us. Uh, whether it's through joining advocacy groups, through communicating um, with Manatos and Manatos, through reading on what we're doing and remaining educated, that we can impact change. And uh, that's a fantastic story. I didn't know uh, that detail about how Senator Bob Menendez became a Philhelene. <laughs> it's fantastic. You no, know, I should mention on that about getting involved, because this is, again, a perfect example of how the American Hellenic Council gets it. Um, and unfortunately, far too few people 
too few people, um, not only in our community, but Americans don't understand how the process works. Um, if you're a member of Congress, uh, you get on average 5,000 written communications a week. If you're a senator, you get an average of 25,000 written communications a week. So the old write a letter to your senator, send an email, they literally bounce off a brick wall. If we got in one day 15 constituents, not just Greek Americans, but a constituent to email the member of Congress and say, we want you to do this for Greece for Cyprus. What these offices do is they come in and they report not to the member, but the chief of staff say, okay, today we got um, 387 emails on health care, you know, 450 on the president's bill on this, you know, they, oh, and, and, and I would imagine a lot of offices, they don't even report subject matters that are below 100 or below 50. So, and that's a hard thing to do to get 15 different people in one day to email. And, I, and this is where uh, the Hellenic American Leadership Council has done a good job in, in making it easier for people to engage online and trying to up those numbers. But that's one day. And then the next day goes by. From zero come the next day, they say, well, how important is this issue to us? So the way you engage senators and members of Congress, unfortunately, it's a very expensive way to do it, but it's through raising money or contributing. Um, the average, the amount of money that a member of Congress has to raise to get reelected or get elected and then reelected is phenomenal. Over a million dollars, even if they've got a safe seat, because everybody's so worried about these self-financers coming at the last minute, they need to raise a lot of money to scare them off. So even if they've got no one on the ballot running against them, they're still trying to raise over a million dollars. Well, do the math. You got two years to raise a million dollars. You got only so many work days in, in the year. You're going to be raising tens of not hundreds of thousands of dollars a day. It's insane. So if you walk in and say, listen, we would like to try to help relieve you of that burden. And we'd like to raise some money. And we'd like you to sit down and talk with these leaders. Most policymakers are up for that. Um, and that is the way to get their attention. It's expensive. These things, you know, the, the least amount of money to get at a table like that with a policymaker is maybe 250 more likely $500. Um, it's expensive. A lot of people don't understand the value of that. Um, so that's how they get to hear you out. Now, let me make something crystal, crystal clear. If that policymaker, I go and I write a check, I sit down and we raise some money for him. If you go back to him and say, look, we'd like you to do A, B, and C. If A, B, and C, that policymaker doesn't think is what's best for their constituents or what's best for the country, they'll say, look, I'm sorry, I can't do that. And if that person would have said, well, I gave you this much money, he'd say, well, take your money back. First of all, I don't need it. I got to raise a million dollars. It's nice of you to give me $500, but, um, you know, it's 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 a way of of getting their ear and getting their focus and 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 one to one and so what we have done in Washington and throughout the communities in, in New York and L A is done these kinds of fundraisers particularly in the districts those are even more valuable um, and uh, what a lot of people in our community don't understand is they think well the reason that senator member is going to support our issues is because we're on the side of justice and there's illegal Turkish invasion and occupation and and the, you know, Greece needs our help financially. And, and the, the logic of your issue does not win the day, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. It's access and it's relationships. And the way you develop relationships is by contributing and raising money. And then they get to know you and then they get to see how they can help you. And then you can better help them understand, look, a huge number of the people who are helping you get elected think this is important. And, and so that's, that's how it all works. American Atlantic Council understands it. You guys do fundraisers for your local officials. When, when you've got honorees come out to be honored at your, uh, your gala, you'll do fundraisers for them. Um, it's an important part of this process and just so few organizations and individuals in our community understand that that's how it works. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's a strange thing where you can go with someone in our community to a, a restaurant and there'll be 10 people there and there's a fist fight on who gets to pay for the you know $1,500 check. You go to that same person and say, could you come to this event and $250 for this member of Congress? The, ah, you know, I'm busy. I can't do it. It just, it just, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't <laughs> jive, but unfortunately it's, it's far too often the case. So again, thank you to all that you and the American Atlantic Council does, Mike Galanakis, Eris Anagnos for so many decades and our other friends, Minas Gafatos and your, your current president who we worked with when he was with the HEPA and, and now American Council, um, get it. 
and, and are doing their part to engage these important policymakers who can really make a difference uh, with regards to the, the issues of concern to Greece and Cyprus and the Greek American community. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, um, where are we, do you know, in the development of the center? which is going to be part of this Eastern Med uh, Act. It's going to be in D.C. Do, do we know anything about the center? Um, I haven't seen um, a lot of specifics on that. I think, um, as is the case a lot of times with this legislation, they're you know, advocating these kinds of things to get people thinking more about it. I think that's <laughs> going to be a lot that's going to be left up to you know, possibly the next administration. I think it, it while the cut, while the legislation passed, it was it was a huge victory. Us, then we certainly all of a sudden got consumed in in the, in the, the pandemic, and a lot of yes. these things have been put on hold. Um, so I haven't heard the latest on that, but I do think at least it's a foot in the door, as they say, something that we can build upon. Yeah. Well, so we spoke a little bit about the U.S. administration and how Congress works. Let's uh, pivot to Greece. We have Prime Minister Kiriakos Mitsotakis, who within six months of taking office, visited the U.S. He was then um, accompanied by his diplomatic attaché or head of his diplomatic office, today Ambassador Alexandro Padopoulou, and you played an integral part in organizing that visit for him in D.C. Um, what did the visit entail? How was he received by, by the U.S. administration? Yeah, it was, our, it was our pleasure and honor to do so. We've known the Mitsotakis family for, for generations. I've known Kiriako for many years. Um, his wife, Mareva, believe it or not, was an intern at Manitas and Manitas when she was in the D.C. area during... Wow! So we even have a relationship <laughs> back to then with Mareva, who's her own force in Greece and what she's doing as a businesswoman and, and on issues of importance to the Greek people. Um, so we were thrilled and excited about it. Um, it was really a remarkable trip. Not only did he have the meeting with the President of the United States um, in the Oval Office, um, he also had a, with his cabinet that he brought over with the President's cabinet, a substantive meeting in the Roosevelt Room um, that evening. Um, you know, in, in Washington, a lot of way of communicating the importance of an issue or a country is the way they're received. Um, because there are just certain levels on which you, you are um, received. Um, not only was there a large reception at the State Department, uh, it was co-hosted by the Vice President of the United States and the Secretary of State, um, which again sends a big signal uh, throughout Washington that, wow, this is a, you know, a country and a person of great importance to the United States. Earlier in the day, I believe it was that day, he was received in the House of Representatives by the Speaker of the House and the House Republican leader. Again, a bipartisan, highest level possible reception in the House. In the Senate, he had a very substantive meeting with uh, the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, and again, driven by the great work of Bob Menendez. Um, but a lot of times you'll have a prime minister of a major country, you know, India or Great Britain or, or Germany. And the way these things work because of the schedules and, and because of all the different responsibility senators have, you'll get, you know, seven, eight, nine senators show up for the discussion, for the one hour discussion. We were able to help get 12 United States senators, bipartisan representation to attend and hear firsthand from Prime Minister Mitsotakis. And I got to say, um, he is, I think, the perfect face for Greece at this time. Um, not only obviously is his English spectacular, but he, having spent a lot of time in the United States, he understands the mentality of the United States and what's important to them. So not only articulating Greece's priorities, but in a way that makes it more digestible and more important to the United States. Um, so I think he did a, just a really remarkable job uh, throughout all of his meetings. Um, I'll say that when he was meeting with the president, that was one of the most challenging because of all the intense scrutiny on the impeachment trial and other things that were going on. Uh, he very masterfully found a way to insert himself into this scrum around the president that were peppering him with questions about impeachment. And the president, as you know, is a, 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 um, a unique person in those kinds of situations. And uh, a lot of times doesn't like to be interrupted and then obviously is irritated by 
by the, the line of questioning, but the prime minister found a way to kind of keep bringing it back to Greece and <laughs> reminding the president how Greece was being supportive and thanking the United States. They did a, a masterful job there. Um, the only major piece to that visit was the, um, we had a, uh, a lunch um, where we honored the prime minister and the first, the, in effect, the first lady, Mareva, um, at, uh, at a hotel in Washington. We had it co-hosted by, I think it was six different uh, major national Greek American organizations uh, from Leadership 100, the Archons, the Ecumenical Patriarchate, uh, HEPA, uh, AHI, HALC, and the Washington Orchidee Foundation. And um, we, um, it was a, a nice opportunity for the prime minister to address the community, the community leadership, um, and you know, it very well received. So it was really a, a remarkable uh, visit from a number of perspectives. From, from our perspective as the ones who, after the prime minister flies off, we go back to our, our daily, hourly efforts to promote Greece in the United States. And to have that kind of footprint left behind is, is truly remarkable. But I also think the opportunity for the community to see him and receive him and, and hear from him and um, see him in action really brought a lot of energy into our community. So we're very much looking forward to the future ahead. Although I've got to say, we've had some some great uh, administrations in Greece over the years, and one of which I remember distinctly is that your mother was involved. With. First, <laughs> yeah. with George Papandre was his foreign minister and, and then his prime minister. Uh, for those who don't know, uh, Christiana is... As you know, many of you know her and how remarkable she is. She is the spitting image of her mother, her beloved <laughs> mother, who um, was, did such a remarkable job behind the scenes in Greece and promoting U.S.-Greece relations that we actually named an award after her, uh, the Mariana Conales Contu Award that we give every, every year in the United States uh, to someone who, like she did, behind the scenes, d is doing remarkable things to strengthen the relations between the United States and Greece. And it's so wonderful for me personally, you knew your mother and loved your mother to see you following so closely in her footsteps. So it was, uh, it's great to work with you in this capacity as well. Oh, Mike, thank you, thank you. That's, uh, ha, I'm gonna blush now. Um, but, <laughs> but there's, uh, you know, as one of the major ancient Greek values, esterophimia, so your legacy, I appreciate you uh, and Tseka and everybody involved for for keeping that legacy alive. It's, uh, it's much appreciated. Um, but speaking of legacies, tell me a little bit, you mentioned the Washington, the Washington Orchidee Foundation. Now that's something you and your father, Andy Manatos, have co-founded, correct? If I'm not right. mistaken. Can right. you tell us a little bit about that organization? I sure can. I think that um, it's, it's you know, we're coming up on our, our 10th year of the foundation, but it's the 80th anniversary of the famous Orchidee. And uh, we're actually on October 28th of this year, God willing, we'll be having our annual event in Washington on the exact day, 80 years ago, in which Greece very courageously stood up and said, oh, he. And what we do with this foundation is to not only highlight the courage of Greece at that time, which many people forget, the Nazis had rolled over 15 countries. Uh, the, the world's greatest superpower at the time, it either had a uh, were either neutral or had a pact with the Nazis. And in many ways, the world had given up. And here was little Greece who stood up and said, you know what, we may fall, we may be slaughtered in this, but it's the right thing to do, just as they did with the 300 Spartans. And, and it was President, U.S. President Roosevelt at the time who said at a time when the world had lost all hope, it was Greece that stood up in the spirit of freedom. And it was Winston Churchill who said, um, a lot of people are familiar with this quote that no longer will we say that Greeks fight like heroes, but that heroes fight like Greeks. But what he also said that a lot of people don't know, as he said, it were, were it not for the courage of the Greeks, we don't know what the outcome of the war would have been. So the democracies and the, fr the freedom that we enjoy today is doing great part because Greece stood up and did the right thing. As many people know the Nazis had to de delay their invasion of Russia and come back and, and finish off the Greeks and then occupy the country. Um, and the Russian field marshal said that, that uh, were not for the Greeks, um, we wouldn't have been able to defend ourselves. And it was uh, Hitler's field marshal at the Nuremberg trials who said, if the Greeks had not delayed us, we would have beaten the Russians, we'd have won this war and you would have been sitting in this chair at this trial right now. So little Greece, once again, stood up and, and, and did the right thing, showed great courage, and um, what we try to do is celebrate that courage in modern day heroes. So there are people in this world who have 
nothing to do with Greece, no Greek blood, who are displaying the same kind of courage the Greeks did in World War II. Some of our more notable heroes uh, have been um, a woman named Nadia Murad, who now four or five years ago um, was captured by ISIS in Iraq, uh, made a sex slave, and after a year escaped. And I think after most of us, after going through such a horrific experience, would spend the rest of our lives in seclusion, yet this little four foot 10 woman uh, who saw her seven brothers slaughtered along with their mother when she was captured, said, I'm going to take ISIS to the International Court of Justice to hold them responsible for the crimes against humanity. And I'm gonna ask Amal Clooney to be my attorney, which she did. And so when we approached Amal Clooney saying, do you know anybody who displays this kind of spirit of of the little guy against the big guy, she said, I've got the person for you. Well, Nadia Murad received the Ahi Courage Award in Washington now three, four years ago. And in her acceptance speech in her native language, she said, just as the Greeks said Ahi to the Nazis, I say Ahi to ISIS. So it takes that Ahi spirit and applies it to the evils of today. Two years later, she received a Nobel Peace Prize and was the second youngest in history the award to receive the prize. Um, the year before that, our honoree was um, James Foley. A lot of people, I'll say that name, you know, I said, it sounds familiar, where sadly, he was an image that, in fact, of all the news stories, the 9-11 was the most well-recognized news story in the world. The second most was the James Foley story. He was tragically the American journalist who was on his knees in the orange jumpsuit, who was brutally beheaded by ISIS, first American killed after we started our bombing against ISIS. And James Foley's parents, a month and a half after that brutal execution, were at, on stage at the Yorkie Day Foundation event, receiving the Yorkie Courage Award in, their na in, 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 in honor of their son, who we had President Clinton nominate for the award. And they said that Jim didn't have an ounce of Greek blood in his body, but he had Philotimo. And so you see these people who are on leading the news all around the world, receiving the Ahi Courage Award, and these people say, well, what's the Ahi Courage Award? What's Ahi Courage? Which we have now, hashtag Ahi Courage. And so it's a way to revive that spirit of the Greeks that lives on for these people. And, you know, in some ways, you, you're seeing it again with the way that Greece handled the COVID-19. I mean, it's really remarkable. In times of crisis and world crisis, little Greece sit up and says, you know what? We're going to do this the right way, and we're going to implement measures and and you know, just some of the statistics we put out yesterday, it's really remarkable. If you look at the deaths, the number of new cases and deaths uh, in Greece and in Cyprus, frankly, compared to the rest of the region, it's remarkable. We looked at just April 11th through 20th, and the new cases per day, United Kingdom, 4,600, Turkey, 4,600, France, 2,400, Italy, 2,200, Greece, 10, Cyprus, 5. United States, 25,900. Now, like some people might say, well, that's because those countries have much larger populations. But if you break it down, if you do deaths per total million, United States, 142 deaths uh, a day per million. Oh, excuse me, this is total deaths per million so far. Um, you have Spain, 464. Uh, again, this is adjusted for population. Italy, 415. France, 327. Greece, 12. Cyprus 11. So again, they, I think, were a model for the rest of the world on how to get this done. And this was Greece coming out of a 10-year financial crisis, their Great Depression, where 75% of their healthcare system was devastated. Uh, it's one of the reasons they came down so hard to try to find a way to, to get in front of it. Um, but I, let's see, I'm trying to find the quote here. It was Time Magazine... <clears throat> on the 22nd, so today's Friday. So on Wednesday, Time Magazine had this article titled, How Greece Avoided the Worst of the Coronavirus. And here's the quote. The coronavirus outbreak in Greece should have been a disaster. The country's population is the second oldest in the EU, behind only Italy. Its health sector has been ravaged by austerity and its crippled economy is still near 40% smaller than it was in 2008 before the last global financial crisis. So it's not only remarkable what Greece did, but considering how bad it could have been, given uh, the, all the factors that I just mentioned, it's even that much more remarkable. And like I said, you know, the, the numbers in Cyprus are, are similar. So I think in our minds, it's, it's another example of how 
the world was tested. And once again, Greece and Cyprus stood up and showed the, re the, world, the rest of the world the way, the way to get it done. Yes, you know, uh, to bring it, uh, to make it a correlation uh, that's close to home, Los Angeles County is a total of 11 million population. So Greece okay. is about 11 million. As of April 23rd, LA County had over 16,000 cases and over 750 deaths. Greece had approximately 2,200 cases and 125 deaths. So even if you qualify it uh, as a percentage rate, it is impressive, not to mention given the proximity that Greece has to, to Italy, both geographically, but also uh, Italy and Greece uh, about, count about 70% of Greece's trading in cargo and people. So the, the transfer uh, and the potential of disaster that has yeah. been averted is unbelievable. I agree that the Ohi courage uh, remains. <laughs> well, I, I gotta say, you know, part of it's, it, it's the mentality of the Greek people, because some would argue, in fact, I frankly was a little worried about this. I mean, Greece, people, they're, they're known for their spirit and they're kind of their defiant spirit, right? I mean, the fact that, they're, that for 10 years there's been a no smoking ban in Greece, <laughs> yet people were smoking like chimneys all along until recently, it speaks to their kind of their defiance to laws and regulations and and especially, how can you stop us from being with each other and hugging and kissing? But the Greek people really stepped up. They really showed there's a certain level of courage to do the right thing and to really look out for each other. And, and they did an excellent job. So um, I'm really proud of the way the Greek people have, have handled it. We let policymakers know about it, and they're all taken aback. It's unfortunately not getting enough traction. There's that Time Magazine article, but not enough people, when talking about countries that are doing the right way, are mentioning Greece. In yes, fact, I've noticed that as well. It's uh, well, we will we will all do our part to try and uh, educate our members, right. the uh, members of Congress. That is, uh, yeah, in Easter, that was. I don't know if you looked at uh, some of the yeah. images of Easter. I was uh, on the phone with all my family out there, and everyone's on their balconies with their labades. And as uh, the ambassador, when we spoke last week, said, you know, the resurrection is a message of hope, and Greeks are resilient. So this is, this is hope. This is what it looks like. So uh, right. I, I, I have to say, I hope this brought us uh, closer together and right. unified us, which I think it has in Greece at, at the very least based on what I'm reading. So, you know, um, well, Mike, thank you. I think uh, thank you've you. shared so much. I don't know if there's anything else we could possibly learn right now about U.S. advocacy in Greece and Cyprus. <laughs> I just want to close by, by thanking you again for the opportunity, thanking your president, Jim Dimitriou, your past president, Minas Kafatos, and Michael Galanikis, and all our friends on the board who I've worked with over the years. You guys do such a fantastic job. And I think this interview series is another example of that. I think huh. um, I've loved seeing you there um, as executive director and taking the, the organization in new directions like this, this digital platform, it's exciting to see. Um, I'm particularly proud, as I mentioned when I speak there, that it was not too many years ago that you were my guest visiting in LA and I said, why don't you come yes. to the American Learning Council? And then they met you and learned about you said, oh my God, how can we get her to, uh. to work with us? So I'm thrilled that I came back the following year, you were executive director and doing a heck of a job. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, the American Atlantic Council family and look forward to continuing to work with you all. Um, so I missed your, your gala. I hope whenever it's rescheduled or if it's next year, I'm, I'll be there. Yes. Thank you so much, Mike. Thank you for everything and for everything you do to advocate for Hellenism and for always supporting the AHC and me personally in all of our endeavors. Really appreciate it.